Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Inept General, and welcome to another Total War Warhammer Legendary Lord Law video. And today we are doing Gorbad Iron Claw, the legendary orc. If you enjoyed this video, do consider joining or subscribing, or even just dropping a like. Any little bit helps the channel. Got some exclusive content for our members already in the member section. Now up to part seven in our ongoing Malice series, if you want to check that out. And we are revisiting the old retro game Shadow of the Horned Rat. But other than that, let's get on with the story. Gorbad began his rise to power in the Badlands, where he first emerges as the leader of the Iron Claw tribe based out of Iron Rock in the year 1705. Gorbad sent out his warriors to overrun the World's Edge Mountains, to carve out vast swathes of territory. The only powers that stood in the way of the Iron Claw Orcs were the Broken Tooth tribe, led by their huge war boss, Crusher Zogoth, and the dwarves of the region, who still wielded great power in their Karaks. The Broken Tooth tribe were traditional rivals of the Iron Claw Orcs, and they would be the first to feel the wrath of Gorbad's growing legions. In his rise to power, Gorbad had learned to annihilate rival leaders in as horrific and violent a way as possible. This often intimidated the rest of the mobs who would then rush to join his armies. As such, a horrible fate was in store for the leader of the Broken Twos. Gorbad had recently subjugated a group of night goblins, and he used them to tunnel beneath Black Crag, the home of the Broken Tooth tribe, and the abode of Crusher Zogoth. Once the tunnel had been completed by the night goblins, Gorbad ordered them to drive a massive herd of squigs through the tunnel to be unleashed on the Broken Tooth tribe. And so the squigs were forced down the tunnel, and the screams began to be heard outside the walls of Black Crag. And Gorbad simply waited. He waited for the sounds of battle to die down before walking into Black Crag unchallenged. He soon found out where Crusher laid his head, and all that remained of his rival was a blood stain on the floor, having presumably been torn apart and gobbled up by the Squig Onslaught. The survivors of the Broken Tooth tribe accepted Gorbad as their new leader, as is the fashion of Greenskins, who know when they are beaten. By this point, Iron Rock had been turned into an impregnable fortress, and from his domain, Gorbad established his vast territories, claiming rulership over all the peaks between Mad Dog Pass and Fire Mountain. During this period, Gorbad began to appear regularly in the Book of Grudges of the Dwarves. While almost all of the greenskins that Gorbad encountered merged with the Iron Claw clan, the dwarves were another matter. When Gorbad encountered dwarves, he exterminated every last stunty. The dwarf holes he conquered were so thoroughly looted that not an ingot of gold, lump of copper, or scrap of iron ore remained. Tales of Gorbad's personal deeds also began to spread and were told in every tribe. The tale of the great orc personally besting two giants at once, and how he chased a defeated army of stunties to the gates of the vast dwarven capital of Karazakarak, to knock on the unassailable walls of the fastness so hard that the great dents of his trademark iron claw can still be seen on the mountainside. These were amongst the most popular tales told of Gorbad, and soon orc and goblin tribes from across the Badlands rose up to join this king of all war bosses. It was as if the scent of greenskin victory was in the air, and none wanted to miss out on the slaughter. The dwarves soon recognized the futility of fighting such numbers of greenskins and simply shut the gates of their remaining holds to wait out the tempest. So in the year 1707 of the Imperial Calendar, some 800 years before the coronation of Karl Franz, seeing that the Stunties wouldn't come out to play, Gorbad ordered his armies northwards in search of a more lively prey. 
By this point, Gorbad's horde had reached an astronomical size, the likes of which hadn't been seen since the time of Sigmar. As a terrific thunderstorm crashed about the peaks of the Black Mountains, the war pushed its way through Blackfire Pass. The Dwarven and Empire garrisons in the pass were overrun in days. Tunneling goblins attacked from within as brutish orcs battered at the walls and put the defenders to the axe. The Empire at this time was riven with discord, with a number of noble families competing to place their scions upon the throne. For this was the time of the Free Emperors, and the once mighty Empire had splintered along religious and provincial lines. There was the line of the Attilan Emperors, who were based out of Talibekland, the line of the Wolf Emperors out of Middenland, and the line of the so-called Elected Emperors, who were based out of Altdorf, who at this time was Emperor Sigismund. Gorbad's Horde had pushed down from the mountains into the provinces of Avaland and Soland. As the green tide crashed into the Empire, on its distant flanks, a great force of goblin wolf riders rode far to loot and destroy outlying towns. Meanwhile, the numberless orc and goblin tribes followed along the old dwarf road. The ground shook, heralding the approach of Gorbad's army. More accustomed to the harsh badlands rather than the rich green hills of Avaland, the Horde amassed so much plunder in just a few days that Gorbad ordered an encampment at the ancient elf ruins of Free Towers on the borders of the Moot, the home of the Halflings. It took three days for the war boss to sort out his battle lines, straightening up the newcomers, put down a handful of challenges, and stop some of the shiftier goblin tribes from re-stealing what others had already pillaged. Surprised to find his lands covered in a seething tide of greenskins, the Count of Avalon sent messengers to his neighboring provinces. Amazed to be granted even a short reprieve of the greenskins made camp, the Count used Gorbad's delay to send the bulk of his region's troops as reinforcements to shore up the moot's defenses. It was a futile gesture. When Gorbad struck north, he caught the Empire armies on the Ava Down, a range of low hills in the southern moot. The halflings who lived there were easy prey, even for goblins, and the rest of the army was overwhelmed. Only a few knights panther escaped the slaughter, their warnings to the Emperor Sigismund focused on the immense size of the invasion and on how Orc Gorbad maneuvered his troops with devilish cunning. The orcs and goblins spent two days ravaging the moot, the remaining halflings attempting to escape, often by fleeing down the river Ava. The river grew so overcrowded with boats and improvised rafts from the fleeing refugees that the malicious goblins couldn't resist setting up their war machines to take target practice on the boats below. The torment of the halflings, which the greenskins called bite-sized runts or squealers for their habit to emit shrieks when being chewed, proved very popular. Camps held halfling eating competitions, barrel battles consisting of snotlings versus halflings fighting it out in an empty crate, and other barbaric cruelties were carried out with joyful glee by the greenskins. Refugees fleeing the moot and from other parts of the empire poured into the city of Averheim. With greenskins hard on their heels, it was not long before the great city was being battered by war machines, most of which were unusually accurate after all of their recent practice. After a brief bombardment and a few feints, Gorbad ordered a mass assault. Averheim's gates and walls were broken, and the war leveled the city in a spate of destruction. By this time, Gorbad Ironclaw's reputation had spread even further. Tribes of Orc River Raiders rode their rickety fleet to join the throng. Innumerable greenskins from the forests, mountains, and plains, and from far afield as the Darklands, marched to swell the horde. Gorbad's armies were larger than ever as they looted the remains of Averheim. But Gorbad had greater plans and soon massed the largest orcs into mobs. These biggins prowled the ruined streets, gathered up drunken greenskins, and dragged them back into marching order. Many heads were knocked together to remind all newcomers who was boss. 
Gorbad's war swept on relentlessly. It is worth noting that at this time, Gorbad's looting of the empire took time. He entered the empire in the year 1707, and around this time it is approaching the year 1712 of the imperial calendar. So he has spent five years raiding, looting, and pillaging most of the southern empire. And Nullan was next to be assaulted. The Greenskins poured over the walls in a rampaging fury that promised to repeat their swift victory at Averheim. Brutus Lightdorf, the Count of Averland, ordered a retreat over the Great Bridge and rallied his troops in the western half of the city. Lightdorf's ingenious fighting retreat and the inspired destruction of the Great Bridge nearly saved half of Nullen. However, Gorbad not only outfought, but also outmaneuvered his foe. His newly acquired flotilla, containing every orc raider from as far away as the Reich and the Stir rivers, was ordered to ferry troops, while Gorbad kept pressure on the defenders. He also commanded the construction of a crude but functional floating bridge, cobbled together out of half-wrecked ships and smoldering beams hauled from the destroyed half of the city. His forces gained the beachhead and finally swarmed across the river in great numbers. By nightfall, the whole city was burning, and survivors, including Lightdorf, fled towards Altdorf. The destruction of Nullen was a great blow to the Empire, but it was about to get worse for the greatest nation of the Old World. With a large portion of their fighting forces already mauled by Greenskins, Emperor Sigismund could only beseech the northernmost provinces for aid and watch the Greenskins descend upon the southern territories. With no challenges from the north, Gorbad ordered the plundering of Soland and Wiesenland. In a nearly hopeless effort, Count Eldred of Soland and Count Adolphus of Wiesenland joined their armies to stave off the invaders. The ensuing battle came to be known as the Battle of Solon's Crown. The combined army of the Counts could not stand against War Gorbad, and as the army began to flee, Count Eldred led his faithful warriors forward, plunging into the swirling melee to face the leader of this horde of orcs. Resplendent in his long cloak and glittering crown, the last Count of Soland faced the terrifying form of Gorbad Ironclaw in single combat. That Eldred was brave cannot be held in doubt, but to face the might of such a powerful warlord demanded a kind of insanity, and even armed with the might of a runefang, Eldred was no match for Gorbad, and he was brutally cut down, his body dismembered and hung upon the warlord's trophy racks. The Soland Runefang, one of twelve magical swords given to Sigmar's heirs by the dwarves in ages past, had been lost and claimed by the Greenskins. Gorbad tore the crown of Soland from the Count's head and placed it on his own. The Count's remains that seemed surplus to Gorbad's trophy rack were fed to Nala, Gorbad's fierce and heavily scarred boar. Over the next few weeks, Soland was so utterly razed that its old lands and ruined cities were afterwards absorbed by neighboring provinces, and Soland was no more. So utterly devastating had War Gorbad been that it managed to completely wipe out an entire province of the Empire. Seeking further spoils now, Gorbad turned his war back north, heading towards the Empire's capital of Altdorf. Knowing what Gorbad would do to Altdorf should he besiege it, Emperor Sigismund called upon the cream of the Empire soldiery to mount a desperate sortie, while further reinforcements could be gathered from the north. Many Reichsguard, Knights Panther, and Knights of the Blazing Sun were placed under the command of Eric Adolphus, the Count of Wiesenland, who had taken refuge in Altdorf after his ill-fated attack on Gorbad with the late Count Eldred. This hard-hitting force rode out to meet the oncoming hordes, heading for the towering columns of smoke that rose on the horizon, the telltale sign of the invasion's bloody progress. 
The resulting battle, known as the Battle of Grunberg, was unusual in that it consisted almost entirely of mounted troops on both sides. First to clash with the Empire Knights were the swifter Goblin Wolfriders, who were driven back from the field by the Knights, but Gorbad led a countercharge of Boar Boys, flanked by great mobs of Forest Goblin Spider Riders. Perhaps this was foolish aggression, as the main greenskin host was still miles away, but Gorbad was flush with victories and would not wait for his superior numbers to arrive. His opponent, Count Adolphus, was widely considered the best commander and most formidable fighter in all the Empire. Adolphus was hoping for just such a situation, as he had already faced the overwhelming might of Gorbad's hordes. By luring the hulking orc commander to ride forth with only a portion of his army, the wise Empire general engineered his only chance of victory. With steely resolve, Adolphus ordered his troops to concentrate on killing Gorbad. The meeting of the galloping knights and the charging warbors was thunderous. Wading through it all rode Gorbad his huge battle axe splitting both man and steed in two. Whole regiments of knights were hacked apart in moments, desperate to bring down the monster. Count Adolphus charged into the fray with the last of the Imperial Reserves. Although his elite Iron Claw boar boys were falling around him, no lance or blade seemed to be able to topple Gorbad. Just as it seemed that Gorbad would fight his way out of the thickest knot of Empire Knights, Adolphus thrust his gleaming runefang and pierced the Orc commander through his massive chest. Gorbad roared his anger, and his non-gauntleted hand tore out the penetrating blade, ripping off Adolphus' arm at the socket. The Reichsguard quickly closed ranks to protect the Count. Though they managed to recover the sword from his still-twitching arm, they soon after fled from the enraged Gorbad. The battle was over, with a few surviving knights fleeing for the safety of Altdorf's walls. Irritated by his injury and the escape of his foes, Gorbad commanded the recently arrived bulk of his army to move at the double. This march was immediately followed by a direct attack upon Altdorf's walls, an ill-prepared assault that was bloodily repulsed. Impatient with delays, Gorbad ordered charge after charge, demanding that whole tribes traverse the fens and marshes around Altdorf's southern approach. Countless greenskins perished, sucked into the morass, or trampled underfoot. After a time, Gorbad finally regained his head for tactics and halted the senseless waste of troops and prepared for a siege, but much damage had already been done. Despite their horrific losses, the Greenskins still outnumbered the humans, but Gorbad's war had been checked for the first time. The Greenskin camps surrounding Altdorf were now full of grumbling resentment that had not been heard before under Gorbad's iron rule. While Gorbad ordered the rock lobbers dragged into place, some tribes slunk off with their own foraging. Even as the Greenskin catapults engaged in a long-range duel with the crude cannons of the Empire, the war began to disperse, sometimes in mobs, at other times whole tribes. Many greenskins slipped away. Soon, Reichland was burning from many of the disjointed raids committed by these deserters, although Gorbad's remaining forces never profited from such looting. Hampered by his wound, which would not heal, Gorbad still retained his cunning. He realized he could not keep hemorrhaging troops, nor lead the assault himself, so he unleashed his secret weapon. The chains were severed from the great wagons that had been hauled down from the mountains. With ear-shattering screeches, a half-dozen wyverns burst forth. Gorbad assembled all the reptilian beasts into a mass aerial assault, timing this with yet another full-scale ground attack. The women swooped and dived upon the city's guardians, their vicious claws tearing men asunder and unseating cannons. Amongst the commotion, a wyvern smashed into the Emperor's palace, crashing through the roof of the Great Hall, eating servants by the dozen. Every time the defenders attempted to block its progress, the wyvern would merely shoulder its way through another wall in a shower of wooden splinters and brick dust. When the Emperor Sigismund led a group of archers against the beast, the wyvern brushed aside the bowmen and seized the Emperor in its crushing jaws. Imperial records cite how the surviving archers fled from the horrific snapping sounds. Some reports describe a second wyvern battling with the first, 
for the regal remains. With its appetite sated, the wyvern began to make a nest of banners and tapestries in the throne room, only to be slain by ferocious Reichsguard, who vowed revenge for their emperor. Elsewhere, the aerial assault inflicted many casualties, but failed to follow their orders to break open the city gates. The Greenskins continued to batter Altdorf's walls, with many losses and little success. With his wound troubling him and his horde dwindling, Gorbad had little choice but to break the siege, leaving behind the battle-scarred capital. The majority of the Greenskin tribes broke ranks with Gorbad, some left to return to their lairs, Others are known to have continued their raids into Bretonia, but many turned upon the retreating army, attempting to cut out a larger share of the loot for themselves. Eventually, only the Iron Claw and Broken Tooth Orcs remained, along with a few goblin tribes, too intimidated to leave Gorbad. Gorbad led what was left of his followers along the River Reich, harried all the way by fellow Greenskins and the revenge-seeking men of Solon. Most of their spoils were lost or abandoned during their hasty retreat. One last major conflict remained, however. It was fought in the shadow of the red-coloured mountain known as Blood Peak, immediately south of Blackfire Pass. A dwarf army led by the king of Karazakarak attacked Gorbad's remaining forces. This was retribution for the earlier violence and desecration upon the lands of the dwarves, for the dwarves never forget a grudge. Though Gorbad hacked a path through the dwarven onslaught, his army crumbled around him. As dusk fell, Gorbad was surrounded by stunties, his axe visiting ruin on any who approached. And that was the last that anyone heard of Gorbad. If the orc leader was slain by the dwarves, they have never mentioned it. And if Gorbad made good his escape, it is not known where, for none have ever heard of him again. Whatever befell the great orc, his reputation and memory live on. For orcs, gathered around campfires, their shamans tell the tale, and to them, Gorbad is a legend, a hero who earned a place beside the mighty Gork and Mork. To men and dwarves, he was the living embodiment of the destructive power of war. The mystery of what befell the Solund Runefang and the Solund Crown were as unknown as what befell Gorbad himself. Though many attempts were made to locate these treasures, years passed, and soon the memory of these items faded from the thoughts of men. The dwarves, however, recorded everything in the Book of Grudges, and they did not forget. And it was a party led by a dwarf known as Fane Urgrim Stonehammer, who in the year 2378 of the Imperial Calendar, set off to slay a beast that had been harassing the moot. And upon finding the beast lair, the Fane and his party set about trying to slay the chaos-stricken creature. Eventually, one of the knights in his group, lacking a weapon of his own at this point, stumbled around the dark lair and found the handle to a sword, turning in time to thrust the blade deep into the creature's skull. Fane Stonehammer immediately recognized the craftsmanship of the blade and knew it to be the lost Solund Runefang. The party presented the lost Runefang to the Emperor in Altdorf and were greatly rewarded. And so the Solund Runefang was returned to the heirs of Sigmar and placed within the vaults of the Imperial Palace. And so ended the tale of Gorbad Ironclaw, up until now at least, when he's due to make his return as a DLC character in Total War Warhammer 3, really meant to be the prime orc, the prime example of orcish cunning and whying as he stormed across the Empire and almost brought it to its knees. But as always with these videos, let's have a quick look at what Gorbad played like on the tabletop. So, Gorbad, of course, had his trusty mount, Nala. Now, that was 800 years ago. Whether Gorbad just always calls his mounts Nala, or this is a particularly long-lived boar, we're not really given any information that I recall on the lifespan of boars in the Warhammer world, but let's just go for the sake of argument that he's going to have the same mount. And Nala was noted as not being only of a prodigious size, but also of a prodigious might and flatulence. So that might be an aspect that makes an appearance in Total War Warhammer. He also had his weapon, Morglor the Mangler, 
a magic weapon, as Morglaw is one of the most feared weapons ever to be wielded by an orc warboss. When using Morglaw to Magla, Gorbad would gain, always strike first, and would do D3 wounds. Um, no armor saves were allowed against a weapon, so it will probably have a very high armor piercing when we see it in Total War Warhammer 3. Gorbad also had the special rule, the Great Green Leader, where Gorbad can whip any rabble into an effective fighting force, which meant that friendly units within 18 inches of Gorbad that failed an animosity check, which was a check that all greenskin, not all, a lot, most greenskin units would have to take to see if they could move that turn or fight amongst themselves. It's just the idea that they can get a bit testy with each other, and he could help control that by getting them all moving in the same direction. And the more healthy he was, the better he could do that. This is obviously a wink and a nod to the fact that when he got wounded, it all seemed to fall apart for him. And he also had the boss as a plan. And this is where Gorbad acts as both the general and battle standard bearer for his army, enabling him to bring uh, huge morale buffs to his army. And he has orcs are the best, which is Gorbad was the most inspirational orc of all time and drew the biggest and best orc fighters from across the land to fight under his banner. An orc and goblin army that includes Gorbad may upgrade any number of unit of orc boys and orc orc boys to big uns. So he just allowed you to have a lot more big uns. And so he can probably have a um, lot of bonuses to big in his army in Total War Warhammer. At least that would be my guess. And so that's how Gorbad used to handle on the tabletop. And that brings our video to a close, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know what you guys thought down in the comments below. And if you've liked the video, please do drop a like, subscribe, and maybe consider joining if you can. That would be great and a huge support to the channel. Other than that, guys, as always, a huge thank you for watching, and I hope to catch you all on the next one. All right, guys? Bye.